Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am so happy to be here today with Matt Santry from Well Paid Musician. And we're going to be talking about making money from music, my favorite topic. <laughs> um, so, you know, I Matt and I have a lot of similar ideas about how we can just get rid of this like scarcity mindset when it comes to musicians and really know that you can be- get paid well for your art. So we're going to be talking about that and how he's been able to do that and how he helps other musicians do that as well. But before we jump into that, I always love to hear the backstory because it helps set the stage for everything that we're going to be talking about. About. So Matt, I'd love to know just your backstory as far as like, how long have you been doing music? How did you uh, start performing? And I know you your voice has been on some pretty cool commercials and things like that. And then how you got into private gigs and how you started helping musicians do the same thing. That's a lot. So don't yeah. it take so, <laughs> you a while. That's fine. Let's unpack it. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here today. Yeah. I love talking about this stuff. So um, this is a treat. Okay, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible, but as far as performing, I guess it was when I was in college and I started playing in bands and making money. And there was a point where, you know, I had a job, I had a a part-time job while I was in school and I was making more money with this band that I was in. And we were doing bars and fraternity parties and we were always working. And then I was doing like solo gigs, you know, acoustic guitar and singing and uh, I was like, wow, you, you can make money doing this. So I graduated with a degree in psychology. I, I went into social work and um, I did that full time for five years. But I always felt like I wasn't, you know, pursuing my art and it, or didn't have enough time and energy because I was, it was really physically, well, not physically, like uh, emotionally demanding job to be a social worker. You know, f- I was specifically working with uh, children and adolescents uh, behavior disorders and and uh, the latter part was with um, kids on the uh, autism spectrum. So anyway, it was a lot. And um, same thing happened. I started doing bar gigs, and it wasn't long until I was making more at night than I was, you know, doing the eight to five thing during the day. And um, you know, I'm in my twenties, uh, get getting up at six thirty for work it was not fun, especially you know after doing a bar gig. <laughs> the night before. So I, I, I took the leap of faith and I just, I went all in uh, with music. And as we know, that is a very difficult thing to sustain if you're trying to make a living. So you have to have side hustles. So I was, I would teach music lessons. I even taught driving lessons at one <laughs> point, <laughs> which came in through my, my social work. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, her husband had a had a driving school so i mean i was whatever it took so that i could keep you know performing and so anyway that um that that's a lot that's a lot to do um and if you're not like completely in love with what you're doing and you're not you know making the kind of money you want it it can lead to frustration and burnout so i i eventually got to a point where like um you know pursuing my own music some cool things are happening but um you know it's not enough to keep me self-employed like I wanted to be. And that's when I decided to, you know, explore the private events. Cause essentially what I was doing was the same thing at the bars, but I was just doing it for a lot more money for better audiences. And then, you know, then that would give me the time to do other projects. Like I wanted to release music. You know, I've, I've, I had uh, songs placed on, well, now it's called max, but HBO max, uh, in the last, within the last two years, um, Peacock Network. Um, I've done a lot of commercial work, like jingles for uh, NBC's The Voice. 
Dollar Shave Club. So, um, you know, be, having to play bars five, six nights a week, my my voice would have been, you know, completely fried and not would have been able to do the other commercial work and things like that. So I hope that that was concise enough. Uh, you know, I, I always knew that performing could be a thing, could be a thing that, that could I, I could make a living from and a lifestyle that I wanted. Uh, and it wasn't until I discovered um, how to, you know, turn that into private event work that uh, it really made a huge difference in my career. Yeah. Okay. So let's dive into that. First of all, I want to say that driving lessons idea is so <laughs> good. We were just talking about this because my daughter literally got her permit yesterday and oh I'm God. like, oh, should I have to book her a driving lesson. And my husband's like, Hey, maybe I should go into that. Like, that's something that never ends. Like they're always needing new, yeah. you know, people to teach drivings. It so was that's really money. smart for musicians. It's something you could look into. Yeah, it was good money. I, you know, I already had clearances from working with kids and in, in the whole background. So it was like, yeah, it was, it, but I mean, you would talk about a stressful job. <laughs> I, don't, I don't recommend it long-term. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Um, but so first of all, I want to find out how did you get those like commercial gigs and stuff? Cause I'm sure musicians are listening going, Oh, that's awesome. I want to do that. How did you yeah. get into that line of work? I wish I could tell you like the how to, um, I just fell into it. I was playing a private party. I was at someone's house with my band and one of the guests said, you know, I, I love your voice and I have this talent agency and it's for jingle work. Would you be interested in that? I said, yeah, definitely. And a week later I signed a contract and, uh, they were, it was a lot that, that was, you know, too a, a lot of demoing, like, you get paid to demo and it's not very much union scale is like $282 and 75 cents or something for like two hours. And then they take 20% off the top. So like, that's not a lot, but it was always, but if you land it, mm -hmm. meaning the production company lands it and they use you, they wind up using you. Then you get these, here's the carrot on the stick. You, you get all this extra money that makes a big difference. Um, so that I just fell into from performing at private events. <laughs> but I mean, that really is the how to, right? You were in the right room. Yeah. The right, right place, people, right time. And doing private parties is going to put you in the right room <laughs> with the right people. Or if you're doing, you know, any kind of private events where, you know, people are in attendance and they're like a, a you know, captive audience kind of thing. I think that is where you meet the people that could give you the ends like that, that you couldn't get on your own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't go into it that way, like thinking that, but no. it, absolutely, you know, like, especially if, uh, you know, you're in a, a good frame of mind, which I, I wasn't a lot of time, like towards the end of my bar career, I definitely did not want to be there. And it mm -hmm. showed. And I think that how you present, how you show up, you'd be surprised how many different, you know, the opportunities that will present themselves when you are in a better uh, frame of mind and, and uh, you know, and just serving your audience, really just you're there. Yeah, to... And getting paid what you feel you're worth is mm -hmm. going to put you in that better frame of mind. And that's going to open you up for other opportunities. So that's where I think the private gigs come in. Like you're, you're feeling like, okay, I'm actually getting a decent wage here. I'm not mm -hmm. feeling, you know, I'm not thrashing my voice. I'm not feeling burnt out because I'm having to do this six nights a week because I'm getting paid enough that I only have to mm -hmm. do it this many times a month to pay mm -hmm. my rent or whatever. Yep. So how did you start getting into those private gigs? So I think like most performers, you'll get approached at the bar, you know, oh, we're having a party. And that's a good way to get started. And then what I started hearing was like, uh, yeah, I know, I know specifically what it was. I, I was at, there was a restaurant that I would perform at like twice a month. And someone had approached me about performing uh, at a private event, then they said, you know what, we, we, we found someone else, uh, on this site called gig salad. Mm. And I was like, what's that? So like, I signed up for that one, you know, the next day <laughs> and, and through that is essentially like discovering the customer journey. Right. So there's like, if I'm going to hire someone for an event, you know, there's really two ways I'm going to find out about them. I'm going to either ask, you know, people I trust and know, 
for a referral, or I'm just going to get online and I'm just going to research it that way. So it's a lot easier sometimes to just jump on Google and, and look. And if you follow that path, then you can kind of see like, oh, well, what, you know, what are these type of marketplaces that, you know, I could be a part of that will give me visibility for these type of customers. And I think that's, that's what it was, was like the beginning of like, oh, okay, this is like how to get in front of the right customers. I get it. Okay. This is, this is starting to work. All right. So that was the beginning of it. Mm. And then was it just a matter of getting on that site and you immediately got the first no. gig or do you, how do you make yourself stand <laughs> out on those sites? Exactly. Um, well, you know, marketing presentation, and those are things that I was studying anyway, because there was a point in time where, you know, I was considering just getting out of music because I was so frustrated with what I was doing at the time, playing bars and just, We've all been there. And that's why I love yeah. to hear that on this show, because everybody that's listening has been there yeah. and you're on the other side of it. So they're like, oh, maybe I can get past this rough patch. Yeah, totally. Um, so what I so, yeah, I, at that point in time, I got into running. It was just something to like help clear my head. And I also was just tired of listening to music while I was running. So I'm like, all right, I'm just going to start listening to podcasts. I don't know what these are about. Um, maybe one of you guys is running right now listening That's to this right. podcast. <laughs> and so uh, I just, that guided me towards more marketing stuff. Cause I always liked, you know, as a psychology major, I like uh, learning about how uh, we operate, how our minds work, why we behave the way we do. And I just, that started leading me towards uh, marketing stuff. And through that, I was like, all right, well, how can I, these are like, you know, big businesses, quote unquote, big businesses. I don't know. They were making more money than I was making at the time. So how can I apply this stuff to my music career? And I just started thinking in terms of that. So um, I think that's what helped too, is just like thinking of myself as a business versus like me, the guy who's the musician, like it, it's an easier, um, like a separation. Like if you don't like the product, that's okay. It's not for everyone versus mm -hmm. you don't like me. I have to take it personally, you know? And um, so, all right, how can I, so with that in mind as a business, how can I attract the right customers that are going to enjoy what I do already? And so, you know, I think just getting better at making video um, was one thing, honing in on the right cover songs uh for this these type of events here's here's the story about that a friend of mine got me in with the voice ironically you know i, I didn't make it to hollywood but later wound up doing commercial work for them um <laughs> he got me in a private audition and that year i decided well uh, chris stapleton's cover of tennessee whiskey was blowing up i was like this is a really cool song people you know are, like country is 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 really becoming popular in the mainstream in and i started to see it in like people that grew up on the rock music and and then kind of like 80s 90s early 2000s were starting to get into country a lot and like chris stapleton it was just like this perfect gateway into that genre for a lot of people so i covered the song and i and i recorded it just for the the sake of practicing for my audition for the voice so I get it to my private audition. They're really nice people. You know, there's like eight of them standing around me with five cameras. Okay, what are you going to sing? I'm going to sing Chris Stapleton's version of Tennessee Whiskey. No, you're not. <laughs> what? No, you're not. We've heard this too many times today. So this was like 2016. And I'm like, okay, that's like my money song. Like, what am I going to do now? <laughs> so I just, I played something else and... That was that. But what came of that is I put that video up on YouTube and I shared it on my Facebook page and I got like all this great response and comments. Next thing you know, like I'm using this video in, um, you know, my presentation for, for private event clients. And like every time I'd get to the gig, you know, we love that version of Chris Stapleton. You know, are you going to play that song tonight? I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, and it just kept happening over and over and over again. And so, yeah, just a byproduct of something that I thought was going to work out 
uh, actually was to my favor in a completely different direction that I didn't see coming. Yeah, and we we do tend to get known for a cover song even, mm -hmm. right? I feel like there's a few cover songs that I sing that I am known for and it's requested for. So finding the, those, those money cover songs yeah. is a great way. I love that. So when you're booking for private gigs, are you booking solo? Are you bringing a band? Do you have like different options that they can choose? Yeah, um, all the above, but, you know, I like to focus on what I'm best at and it's solo acoustic. I just, I do really well with that. And I say that not to pat myself on the back. I'm talking about my customer reviews and feedback that I get and the fees that I command. I, I do the band thing and I love playing with the band, but it's a totally different animal in that if someone's hiring a band, they the expectation is that they want to party, they want to dance, and they want to be on that dance floor the entire duration of the event. So you have to know how to do that. And that's something I learned through doing private events. So I wouldn't say that's my strength. I can do it. And I, and I have corporate clients that hire me every year for their annual, you know, summer event, their holiday parties. And so I know what I'm in for and, and, and I can put that together and I, and we always, you know, do it. But on a, if I had to do that on a regular basis, I don't think that would be like, I, it's so much easier to just show up yeah. with my guitar. I have, you know, the Bose plug it in, you know, modular system. And in seven minutes, I'm ready to rock. <laughs> uh, that is so much easier than showing up two and a half hours ahead of time with the PA hiring a tech to assist me doing all the things. So my point is like, yeah, you can do a lot of different stuff. There's a lot of different opportunities. Uh, for instance, people think of private events as just weddings. I don't do weddings because I don't like them. I did, but I don't do them anymore. As of like a couple years ago, I just stopped because it's not my thing. And I make actually make more money just showing up with an acoustic guitar and, and singing at people's houses than I did mm. when I was doing weddings. So um, there's lots of different opportunities, but yeah, just hone in on, on what... Like go where the market's telling you to go. And for me, it's solo acoustic and um, this kind of like country crossover rock style. What you said about weddings, uh, I love sing being a, a ceremony singer. Is mm -hmm. that still a thing? Do people hire for that? Mm -hmm. Or is it all just about the, you know, DJs and the dance bands for the reception? I mean... It's it varies, right? You could have a backyard wedding where, you know, I've done those, it's just me for everything. Or you could have a, a bigger production where they have a string quartet for the ceremony. They have a, a jazz trio for the cocktail hour. Mm. Um, they have a DJ and a band. You know, there's like so many different things that you can do. But yeah, if you just wanted to do ceremony, you know, we have members of our community that are solo instrumentalists that get hired for that kind of stuff all the time mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense what about uh originals versus covers for these kinds of events do you just assume that everybody wants covers only do you ask do you kind of throw oh, yeah. some originals in there and hide them in the mix or <laughs> so yeah i want to be very clear about that they, these people are hiring you to create the vibe for their event and so you have to think of the customer and their needs. And so they don't know your songs. It's not that they wouldn't be open to it, but you want to go forward with a list of popular songs in the genres that you, you're you comfortable with. So I save my original songs for my ticketed shows where mm -hmm. people know they're they're coming to hear Matt Santry's songs. It's not to say what what will happen is kind of cool is that you will have, at least in my experience, repeat customers that become fans of my music, and then request my music at um at private events. Hmm. That that's a cool thing, um or or they'll come to a ticketed show. That's really cool too. But I would say like definitely first time client, you know their event, you cater to what music they want to hear. 
So do you work with them to create a playlist or do you just kind of say like, what kind of stuff do you like? And I'll just come up with it. So your presentation, your demos are kind of like requalifying your, your customer. So if someone's coming for like an R and B dance party, they see my reel. They're not even going to talk to me. <laughs> right. I don't, do, I just don't do that. Um, so they already know the gist of what I do, but what I customers love, I'm, I'm using customer and client interchangeably. What they love is when they reach out for a quote, I, I always say, would you like to see my song list? Mm -hmm. And they love that because it's like, to answer your question, like, I guess in their mind, they feel like they can be part of like creating set lists and stuff. And I will get people, I'll send them, you know, PDF and it's pages long with like 300 songs and, They'll make all these notes and circle, must play, don't play. And it's like, it's fun for them to do. But in the end, I say, look, you know, thank you. I'll definitely play the ones that you want to hear. But, you know, I also work the crowd because sometimes, uh, well, I know what goes over, right? And um, sometimes what you think will go over uh, doesn't. <laughs> and I don't say it that way, but like, um, oh, here's the thing with weddings. You know, there will be the ceremonies, like there are, specific, there are key moments, right? The processional, uh, the recessional, uh, there's first dances at the, at the, um, reception. And for those key moments, you'll probably have to learn songs for that. And, um, when customers would make requests, like we definitely want to hear these songs. I'd say, Hey, I will, de I will give you your key moments because all eyes are on you. And everyone's listening to the music. And mm -hmm. I, you know, we have to make sure that's like, it's just right. But for cocktail hour, you guys are going to be taking photographs. You're not going to hear any of this stuff. I'm going to play the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't say that explicitly, but I, I really just kind of stress like your key moments, the music will be, you know, just as you envisioned. And then for the other stuff, I'm, I'm really good at, um, you know, reading the audience. Mm. I love that. So it's, it makes them feel like it's a partnership, but also you yeah. are, you're reserving a little bit of your own thought process when you're actually live. Yeah. Cause anytime I've tried and I've tried to just go by whatever, you know, the client asked me to play, it doesn't work. I, I know what works from experience. So I always let them know like, yes, I'll definitely do these songs. Um, you know, like at a party, I'll definitely do them. Uh, but I also, you know, I play, I play to the crowd and guests love it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do your thing. <laughs> so I'm curious, do you think that this would work for someone that doesn't play an instrument? So if you're a vocalist and you use tracks, is that ever going to be a situation where you can do private events or do you really need an instrumentalist to come with you? I mean, I don't want to say never, what I mean, I could say what we typically see is that you will have the budget to hire an instrumentalist, right? So mm -hmm. if all you'd have to do is create a demo, you know, a reel of some songs and have an instrumentalist accompany you. Uh, it's just, I just don't see it at events. Like, it's not that it can't happen. I'm sure that I'm. there are some weddings because what, what actually, ironically, I, I see the other way around. I see instrumentalists playing the tracks, and that just seems to really go over well. <laughs> but vocalists weird. playing, yeah, there's a really popular thing right now with like violinists playing I was over say, top like, of DJs, like Lindsey Sterling and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's um. So I see that, like especially weddings, people people like like a like a drummer over top of a DJ. I don't know. It's just like Whoa. becoming a thing, and um. Ironically, I do not see that with singers uh, singing over tracks. Not to say it can't happen. I just don't see that trend right now. Mm. Um, so what I would recommend is if you are a singer that does not play an instrument, just make a demo with an, an accompanist. And then uh, it'd be very easy to hire one. You know, I typically say, like, if you're hiring musicians for private events, like $100 per hour. Mm. Is, is a pretty good rate that, you know, most really good players will, they will do that for. That's great. Thanks for that tip. Cause I know that there are 
many musicians listening right now or watching and thinking, I'd love to do these type of events, but I don't play an instrument. And that can be frustrating to vocalists and demoralizing and feel like you can't book gigs because you, you know, you don't have that support. But in these type of events, it sounds like they can book gigs and get paid enough that they can mm -hmm. afford to hire somebody. So it's, it's almost yeah. like, you know, they're just, they're hiring part of, I mean, you are the business, right? And then you're right. just, you're hiring this person to help you. Exactly. But you don't have to pay them exactly as much as you're being paid. No, it's not a band. It's not, right. you know, you're not a partnership that you're, this is a contractor that you're paying. And it's, you know, if you pay well, it's, it's easy to find. So for instance, if you had a cocktail hour, well, I guess what cocktail hour wouldn't be enough because uh, it would only be an hour, but for my $100 per hour rate thing. W when I hire musicians, I if I don't know the musician, I can I can start with $100 per hour. So it's like a four-hour event, 400 bucks. I, I like to pay more uh, just because I have the budget, and then also it makes it easier for me to find uh, great players. And then some of these musicians who are like, they also play on my original stuff. They're my friends. So, you know, if I can take care of them, I will. But as the business owner, I'm I'm making more. I'm making at least double. So I think that maybe that's another formula. If it's a cocktail hour, uh, you can't go buy the $100 per hour thing. Just make double what you're paying the accompanist. And then mm. awesome. they'll, they'll, they'll be happy. You'll be happy. It'll work out. Yeah. Oh, man, I love that tip. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I know that. So after you got this kind of dialed in for yourself, you started working with musicians and helping them to mm -hmm. understand how to do these private gigs and get paid and set up their business and all of that. And that's where the well-paid yeah. musician came in. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear kind of how that got started. Yeah. So uh, I wasn't planning on mentoring. I just, I had, uh, when I was getting um, my band off the ground and I was getting a lot more work, I wound up working with someone who was in college at the time. He was really talented keyboard player and guitarist and i was like wow man if, if, if i can get this guy you know working with me um because at that point you know the bar scene was was extended out into like casinos beach clubs um so there was a lot more like band type of work and um so you know this this per this guy right now you know, he's eight what eight or nine years younger than me so like essentially i didn't even know it i was i was mentoring him and i and i i don't say that again he, he credits me for this um you know now he's a multiple six-figure business as a like a dueling pianos mm. uh performer and uh agency owner so he has a whole roster of of uh, musicians that he can send out for events and he also performs you know at many events himself so you know he started as just you know, someone in my band there was an, another performer who uh, was a bartender at one of the venues I used to play who used to keep me afterwards like here I'll pour you drinks just tell me how to do this and, and you know and that whole relationship and and that guy's killing it now so so that was kind of like the start of it and then when I I think it was like um I was in a Facebook group of, of local musicians and we would just kind of like you know here's our trade secrets and we would talk about stuff and I just start, you know, hey, uh, you know, you, you told me about these sites. I just booked a, a ceremony and cocktail hour for, you know, 750 bucks. Like, thank you so much. Like, you know, I only get paid like 175 to play these bars. So this was like, this was so great. So I was like, okay, all right, well, I need to prove this concept a little bit more and just take on a few more people to help out. And, you know, the business began that way. And, and now it's, you know, blossomed into, uh, I think we have about 400 members. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got people from all over the country. And that's what I love about it because like the biggest objection is this won't work where I live. And it's like, okay, well, if you live in Alaska, it probably won't. But like the economy's pretty constant. Uh, and that's that's not even what it's about. Like it's it's more about like people's perception of money. Like mm -hmm. only rich people hire, uh, you know, or spend a lot for, for weddings or, or parties. And it's like, what's true is, is the, uh, perceived value that you offer, like is, is way more important than someone's buying power. Because if I don't, if I'm, 
Jeff Bezos and I don't value what you do, I'm not, I'm not going to give you much money for it. Right. So that doesn't matter. Um, and, and I have examples on both ends where, you know, um, when I was first starting out, I let someone negotiate my price down and I got to their like 10,000 square foot house with Ferraris and Porsches and the whole thing. And I, and I walked away with like, they just didn't value me. They didn't value, they didn't value what I was providing. I had, you know, the opposite end where I showed up at a, at a party and uh, I, the neighborhood, I was like kind of scared and I, I pulled in and I was like, uh, glad I got a deposit. And, and, you know, again, just making a, a, an assumption that I shouldn't have made because they were wonderful and they tipped and, and, and rehired me the following year. So like, don't ever make assumptions about like people's finances and don't, Oh, just remember, like what people value is going to matter way more than their buying power. Because if it's really important to have live music, then that customer is going to find a way to make it work versus someone that has more than enough to afford it and they that it's not their priority, they're not going to spend the money on it. So, yeah, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, it's hard. And then it's hard not to let our own preconceptions about what we are worth creep in too mm -hmm. you know we yeah. have to remember that that other people don't think about money the way that we think about it and usually the way we think about it needs some work anyway <laughs> yeah well and that's the biggest thing I, I could say about the private events like you know as an artist trying to get like put together a ticketed show so you've got no guarantee and then you know you have to sign of the contract with the venue with and they're going to take this percentage out for these costs and it all makes sense but like you might lose money on the gig or the show or you know if maybe you have a great night and you you made a 150 bucks whatever it is and then look at it from the perspective like you know making thousands of dollars at a private event it's like wow this is this is kind of silly like <laughs> why why am i looking at money this way like <laughs> like yeah you should, I, I'm definitely worth, you know, what I'm charging. It, yeah, completely changed my perspective of of that kind of thing, or like the kind of starving artist perspective mm -hmm. on like, all right, well, yeah, fifty bucks. I yeah, that sounds fair. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, totally. So I know you you also work with DJs, which I think is interesting. How how are musicians and DJs similar in this way and then in the way that they, they book gigs and how are they different? Um, well, I think the difference is obvious, but the, the similarities, the, the events, you know, like we discussed weddings, like DJs and bands, I mean, they sometimes compete. Mm. So um, it's, it's just the vibe that you're bringing. Right. So, Typically, I think DJ, you know, is for more higher energy stuff when people want to dance. But some solo acts are really good at that, too. Mm. You know, we've got musicians that do the live looping and, you know, the backbeat and the whole thing and can get people dancing just with, you know, one instrument and a, a looper. So I think that's what uh, I, I just started to cater to DJs because they're doing the same events and, I, and I'm meeting them when I'm doing the events. Mm. So, and then we have some musicians that have learned to DJ um, because that just opens up the opportunities. And, and that's like a really great fit. If you're do, if you're focused on the wedding market, if you can perform live music for ceremony cocktail hour, and then switch to DJ mode for the reception, mm. like, that that is a really great skill set to offer, and uh, you can, as a you know, a solo act, you make a lot of money doing that. Totally. Now, do you encourage artists to, to try to do any kind of upsells or like add anything as far as like, you know, I don't even know, like offering something alongside their service where they can you know give more to the event, or is it just? more like just this is a service and I pay you this much? That's a great question. Because I know as as we're doing our mm -hmm. original music, we often do that. Like, hey, let's add a green room experience. Let's add a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a bundle. Let's add, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, back to weddings, you can always do that. Uh, a great upsell 
uh, if you were like you're talking about, Brie, you're talking about performing at a ceremony, offering cocktail hour for an additional fee is a great upsell. Mm. You can offer. I mean, I don't I don't like to separate things out like uh, MC services, because that's kind of like you're doing that anyway for the wedding. But you can definitely offer packages. What works really well if you're not doing weddings? Overtime. So set your uh, rate at three hours. And what will typically happen if people are having a good time, the end of the music signals the party ending and they don't want the party to end and you know most times they're drinking so well how much to play for another hour well guess what we already worked that out when we signed the contract a month ago and we agreed on this so it's a real easy conversation oh let me check Let, let's see what we agreed on grab your phone pull up the contract and you know but it's like oh okay here's here's the rate for another hour great Okay, first, I just want to use the bathroom. You know, okay, yeah, yeah, do what you got to do. So you take a little break, <laughs> come back, and then you do like another 45 minutes. Um, and then the, the thing that's really cool that happens after this is that they will, they've already agreed to pay you more. So like the next logical step is like, I, I should probably tip them, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And they tip you. So that is an up, like, it's like a sideways upsell. But I have done like man you know like like 25 percent more revenue in a year just by that premise like restrict the hours to, to last like three hours and then let them hire you for overtime and then like in my experience nine times out of ten if they hired me for overtime they're gonna add a tip on top of that so mm. yeah it's it's just, it's like the sideways upsell <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. And that, that's true. It's like you want to, if it's, if it's a good thing, you want to keep it going. And if you've got that already set in place, super smart. So I know that in your, um, at well-paid musician program, you must help them because there's a lot of logistics around this, figuring out how to book things, contracts, all that stuff, you know, that mm. maybe musicians, it's, it feels a little daunting. Um, so maybe you could tell our listeners a little bit about what you do in that program and how they can connect with you around that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the way that people discover what we do is um, I have a webinar presentation. It's about an hour long. And uh, that's easily accessible on my website. And then the nuts and bolts of the program is, yeah, it's essentially what you're saying. It's like, it's like the step-by-step -step process on how to do these things. But you have to also understand some marketing and and some psychology that we we discussed too for instance like what i just talked about with that sideways upsell the psychology behind it uh there's a book called influence uh robert cialdini and talks about the six principles of influence and it's like um, automatic responses right so for instance social proof like that's a huge one right so like that's the reason why reviews are so important. If you have no reviews, you're pretty much guaranteed to not get a gig from an online search. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a lot of fabulous reviews, then you are going to be you know, trusted and, and things like that. But for the example I was using, um, he talks about this principle of um, consistency. And um, it's like small steps, like micro commitments lead to bigger commitments and if you think about like you know dating and into marriage like there's a lot of steps that go in between and we don't typically skip those steps and there are small micro commitments that lead so the way i look at the whole thing with the overtime and the tip is like these are all micro commitments like once they uh sign a contract um they give you a deposit um you know and then you, you perform and then they agree to pay you more. And then when they agree to pay you more, the, the next logical step is to add a tip. So like that, that's the kind of stuff we talk about. Like when I say psychology, you know, that, that is an example of the, some of the stuff that we teach. Um, marketing is it, in my mind really closely connected to psychology. So, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a lot of practical how to, and, and as far as like, 
booking gigs and, and getting customers, we go through that step by step. That's awesome. So how can they uh, find you online? What is your website? And also how can they connect with you on social? So everything is well-paid musician. So wellpaidmusician.com and then Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. I even have a TikTok. I'm just not as active on that. <laughs> um, uh, so slash well-paid musician. You scored. You got the same handle everywhere? Yes. <laughs> so, so amazing. When did you get that <laughs> handle? I just got to know because I did not succeed in this. Um, well, I didn't even sign up for TikTok and probably until like 2021 or something. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> YouTube, you have to have like a certain amount of subscribers until you can do that. Yeah. So that took a little while, but. Uh, That's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> well, thank you. You have provided so much great, like practical advice on this episode. I so appreciate it. I know people can watch this and they've already learned a ton and be able to go out there and implement it. But I encourage you guys to connect with Matt. And if you're looking to get into this market, definitely look into the stuff that he teaches on his website, wellpaidmusician.com. And I want to thank you so much, Matt, for giving your time and your knowledge and expertise on this episode. Yeah, this was really fun. So I appreciate you having me. I love talking about this stuff. I can keep talking about it all day long. So uh <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.